Let me not to the marriage of true minds admit impediments. Love is not love that alters where alteration finds or bends with the remover to remove. Oh, no. It is an ever-fixed mark that looks on tempests and is never shaken. It is the star to every wandering bark whose worth's unknown, although his height be taken. Love's not time's fool, though rosy lips and cheeks within his bending sickle's compass come. Love alters not with his brief hours and weeks, but bears it out, even to the edge of doom. If this be error and upon me proved, I never writ, nor no man ever loved. Hi there, Greg Swan. That was Sonnet 116 by the immortal bard, whomever that might have been, and um, I am uh, at least sympathetic to the Devarian position on this, if you care. So if you want to send me hate mail on that subject, that'll work too. But um, it's an interesting poem on love. I used it at the beginning of the marriage ceremony that I just did for Anthony Johnson and Marilene Ellis Johnson. Uh, they were just married in Las Vegas this past weekend. I got to be the officiant, and I am uh, endlessly, boundlessly grateful for that opportunity. It was a wonderful, wonderful thing for me. And God, I hope it was wonderful for them. I, you know, I really don't know. And what do you do after that except tell somebody that he did a great job? So who knows if I did or didn't. There will be a video in due course um, that you can see to decide for yourself if I did a decent job and the text that I was working from, my script as it were, is available on selfadoration.com if you want to go and read it, including my um, blank meter rendition of Sonnet 116. I deliberately ripped the meter out, I ripped the scansion out, I ripped the, the iambic pentameter out of it and delivered it as speech as if it were just ordinary dialogue, the way that people would speak, because I think that's a way to embrace poetry and really get the meaning without getting caught up in the meter or the scansion, that the three together are remarkable. And Shakespeare is one of the reasons that we revere him the way he do is because um, he not only said timeless, universal things, but he said them in a way that is incomparably beautiful. And it is the scansion and the meter, in addition to the word choices, the imagery, the understanding of human character, all of the other things that made Shakespeare a great dramatist, in addition to and a great poet. In addition to that, his adherence to the rigor of I iambic pentameter, the, the meter that he wrote in, um, only reinforces the incredible beauty of the <laughs> incomparable catalog of work that whoever that man was, um, he was one of the greatest geniuses who ever lived. And don't let anybody tell you otherwise, and don't let anybody sneer at this because it's difficult. It's difficult because... It's written for smart people, and when you sneer at it, you're just confessing that you're not one of them. Um, but utterly, utterly incredible poetry. So let's talk about 116, because 116 is interesting. Um, it's a great protestation of love, and that's why I opened with it, and I think it's fabulous that way. It's kind of like um, 1 Corinthians 13, which is also read a lot at weddings. I had problems with that, or I might have done it instead. Um great arguments about love, but Shakespeare's argument in 116 is really kind of a bar bet. If this be error and upon me proved, I never written, and no man ever loved. In other words, I'm staking my entire reputation as a writer on this, and bet you know you're going to win, you maybe don't raise the stakes that high. When somebody pushes all in pre-flop, they've either got the stone cold nuts, or they got 7-2 offsuit, they're bluffing. And 116 reads kind of like a bluff all the way through. I mean, it's really protesty. It's really, you know, thou protesteth too much, which we also owe to Shakespeare. 116 protests too much. Let me not to the marriage of true minds. No true Scotsman fallacy right there. Admit impediments. By admission, I'm letting them in the door like they are rogues traveling on the road. And I'm not going to let them into my inn because I know they're troubled. Don't let me admit those impediments. And then I don't have to 
kick them out later. Love is not love which alters when it alteration finds, okay, I like that, or bends with the remover to remove. I think there he's referring to the sickle. Other people dispute this, but I think he's talking the remover is the father time, death, bends with the remover to remove. I really like that. That storgic love in the way that I was talking about it in the wedding ceremony. Love is not love which alters when it alteration finds or bends with the remover. Oh no, this, it's this, it's that. It, no, tempest, it looks on tempest and is never shaken. Oh my God, there's a, an incredible storm outside. The worst kind of a storm you could have is a tempest, and yet it looks on tempest and it's never shaken. It doesn't ever have a moment's doubt. There is no, this is, yeah, they never had a fight. That's what it is. Um, star to every wandering bark. You'll find your way home. A bark is a ship. You'll find your way home because of your love. Um, not time's fool. I like this because it's really true. The guys who stay married successfully stay married because they never see their wives any differently than they did on their wedding day. I go through this with my wife all the time when she is, there are times when she's so in love with me that I worry that I'm going to get arrested for, for a statutory rape. She looks like she's 15 years old to me. I never even saw her when she was that age, but she just, she, when she's at her most loving, when she's most in love with me, she scares me because she's so young. Um, and that's the way guys who stay married see their wives. You know, we know things are going to change. Things are going to sag. Pounds are going to get put on. Things are going to wrinkle up. Him too, but it doesn't matter so much with him. It really matters to him that his wife is beautiful to him, that she's sexually attractive to him. But if he's in love with her, if he's really in love with her, he always sees her at her best. Really, literally, at her best. The best she ever was. The best he ever saw her. That's the way he sees her when he's really in love with her. And that's why it's never a problem for that guy to stay married. It's so much of a problem for other guys to stay married. But for that guy, it's easy. Um, looks on Tempest, barks, and um, all of this other stuff. Loves not time's fool, but bears it out even to the edge of doom. Here's my deal. I'm making an investment. I got one thing to invest. Time, my time, the time of my life is my sole capital. That's all I have. That's all I have to trade. Really, all I have to trade is the time of my life. And I am taking a chance on this other person, this woman, or if it's a woman, I'm taking a chance on this man. I am risking the next few years anyway, but really what I'm hoping to do is to risk my entire life, to push all in on this one bet. This is my big bet. This is my one chance at a lifetime of happiness. That even if I later decide I've made a mistake and move on is what people say, move on to someone else, I can't replace these years. I mean, I may have a better relationship later, three cheers for me, but I can't replace these years. This time will have been gone. It will have been wasted. And how do I make sure I'm not wasting my time? How do I know then I'm going to stay married today. Not just for the rest of all time, but just today. How do I know that my marriage is going to last through the day? How do I know that I'm going to end today married? And it's got to be with someone that I love that way. It could only be with someone that I love that way. And so Shakespeare's bar bet as protesty as it seems, it's nevertheless the exact bet that you have to make when you're getting married. That is the bet that you're making, and it is a bet. You are taking a chance. You have no idea how things are going to work out. You have no idea really who it is that you're marrying because you've only known each other for a year or two years or three years, and maybe you've known each other forever. You were in kindergarten forever, and you still don't know what it's going to be like to be married to that person until you're married to them, and you're, you're taking a chance. You're taking a great big chance, but if you're taking a chance on someone that you love more than anyone else in the world and that you can't, oh God, you cannot imagine trying to build a life without that person. And if you hold that idea in your mind every day while you're married, if you act upon it every day, then you have an excellent chance of finishing the day married and finishing tomorrow married and next month and next year, you have the ability to make plans for a lifetime because you've acknowledged that you've made a lifetime commitment with someone that you don't want to live your life without. Big duh, right? As a part of Anthony's wedding, there was a wonderful reception with lots and lots of really good grilled meat. It was a Brazilian barbecue. It was totally wonderful. It's totally appealing to men, in any case, to meat eaters. Um, but, they, you know, there were toasts. The best man, the matron of honor, and other people gave toasts. And um, Steve Mayetta was there. 
and he invited everyone to give toast, but I deliberately didn't because, I mean, I'd already spoken for 18 minutes. It's time for me to get out of the way and let other people talk, and I loved it. I thought some of the toasts were excellent. Some were wonderful examples of why Shelley Long is a great actress, the role that Shelley Long was born to perform gets performed at every wedding sooner or later. You can't always count on the drunken groomsman, but the Shelley Long character will always show up at every wedding reception, and this was no exception. It was wonderful. All this stuff was fun, and I loved hearing the speakers, and everybody's um, antsy about speaking in public because they think it's going to be a big reflection on them, and I spoke to the maid of honor, and I hope I influenced her. She was worried about her speech, and I said, just see what you, just say what you feel. Think about what it is that you want to talk about, and then just talk about th those things and let your feelings show. Just say what you feel. I I'm talking to you. I'll talk to you for around 20 minutes, and I'm working without notes, strictly extemporaneously. I'm saying what I want to say. I'm saying what I feel, and I know I'm communicating. I know I'm getting through to you, and that's what I advised her to do, and that's what I advise everyone to do. Just say what you feel. Say what you really feel. Be authentic. Be genuine. Don't worry about what anyone else thinks about it, and just be honest. And if you're Shelley Long, it's going to show. And if you really love the person that you're talking to, if you really love the couple that you're trying to celebrate, all of that will come through. It'll be, it'll be wonderful. So in any case, I did not give a toast at the reception because I didn't want to hog the limelight. Um, but I do want to give a toast now and the substance of my toast to Anthony and Marilee, to their marriage, to this brand new home that people came together from all over the country to help them build. Um, my toast to that, to that home, to that family, to that marriage, to that couple, to each one of them as individuals, and frankly to everyone who really cares about the institution of marriage, uh, my toast is in the form of the comment that I had, they had comment cards, please give the bride and groom your advice for everyone to fill out, and what I wrote on my card is start the day married. Four words, start the day married. Do you want to end this day married? Do you want to end this day knowing that your marriage is on a strong footing, that you don't have to worry that you may wake up alone in the morning, that you may wake up finding out the divorce papers have been filed against you, that you're having to compete for custody of your children, that you're, all of the things that you and your spouse have built together are at risk to be destroyed? Do you want to end today married? And if you do, Start the day married. I get up two hours sometimes. Generally, I'm always up before my wife is up. I'm always out of bed before she is. But often, you know, I get up at five sometimes, five, six o'clock in the morning, especially in the summer. I wake up with the morning light and I love it. And she'll get up later and I kind of sort of know when she's going to get up. And so, you know, 20 minutes before she would be getting out of bed, I get back into bed with her. And sometimes we just snuggle together. Very often we just snuggle together in the morning. Sometimes we make love, and I wrote an essay about this, about the perfect morning blowjob, and you think it's all about sex, and let me tell you, it is about nothing but marriage. It's about getting your marriage so good, having your marriage so right, that when you show up naked at your wife's bedside, and she's still sleeping, and she wants to sleep for another 20 or 40 minutes, nevertheless, you're going to make love instead. That's a marriage, and that's a marriage that's working. And we get together every morning, and sometimes we make love, and sometimes we just snuggle, and a lot of times we talk, and sometimes we just sleep. We both snooze, but she's snoozing in my arm, and she's snoozing under my arm. My arm is wrapped around her. Often um, her head is on my chest, very often. That's very common. But sometimes she sleeps with her back to me, and I'm wrapped around her this way, and I've really just got her latched around there. My friend, the cul-de-sac hero, was talking about men that he's been trying to help understand the biologically ordained leadership role that a man has in his family. But you want to talk about the expression of that leadership, the practical expression is right there. Sometimes you hold hands and she reaches for your hand or you reach, a, reach for hers when you're out walking. But when you're in a protective relationship with your, your wife, when there's someone who is being protected and someone who is being the protector, if it's not the man who's being the protector, there's something wrong with your marriage. That's an ontological clue, really stone obvious, 
that there is something really screwed up with your marriage, if her arm is around you and it's not a joke, if she's protecting you from the storm, if she's protecting you from the bad guys, if you are snuggled up into her arm and she's comforting you and you're not ill or injured, guys, there's something wrong with your marriage. This is an ontological clue, and that's what we're talking about, is really practical ontology. I believe in ontology, real things that really exist really right now, existential things, real objects that really exist right now, real events that are happening real, right now, real phenomenon, real people, real motivations, real words, real conversations, real actions in mother tongue, not in father tongue, and this is very much mother tongue. Even though it's daddy doing it, this is the ultimate mammalian expression of male sexual dominance, and it's not common to all mammals, or maybe it's not, I don't know, but it's definitely common to all of the mammals near us on the evolutionary tree, and it is 100% our nature as organisms, regardless of what obtains with, within other species. This is normal and natural for, for human beings, and there is no way to defeat this. And when you organize your marriage the opposite way, so that the woman looks like the man, and the man looks like the woman, the woman goes looking for another man, and the man goes back to his mammy. Because this doesn't work. This is not a marriage that will work. The man has to lead in the marriage, and this is one of the ways he leads. Even if you get up at the same time, you still make extra time every morning to be a couple. Very first thing in the day, to love each other, to snuggle with, with each other, to nuzzle with each other, maybe to make love with each other, to have the early morning conference with each other so that you can work out the details of your day and make sure that you are serving your common interests first. Because you as a person, as an individual, have to sustain yourself regardless of what anyone else needs, but you have committed your needs to this other person's needs, and she to yours, he to yours, whatever. You two are a united front, and one of the times that you have for establishing that unity of purpose and deciding how to affect it, how to exercise it, how to practice it, how to implement it that day is by having time together in the morning. And there's so much, I mean, there are other things that I could point to, ontological evidence that your marriage is no good. If you're not making love very often, if you're not making love very passionately when you do make love, if you're not kind of constantly sort of low-grade making love with each other all the time, little bits of slap and tickle, little funny giggles on the phone, little things that you share together, the kind of things that say, ooh, get a room, and people say, ooh, it's so icky, you know, when they're doing that, you know, that reaction tells you that you're doing it right, not that you're doing it wrong. They're ridiculing you and maybe they're putting you off your feed but what they're really telling you is that they admire and envy the relationship that you have and you're doing it right press on regardless you're winning um but how often you take pictures of your spouse how often your spouse takes pictures of you how often um the photos that you take of each other or that you have other people take of you how often you look lovable and loving to each other rather than ridiculous or pitiful um, how often you expose these photos in public, like on Instagram or Facebook or whatever. You don't have to do that stuff, and you don't have to change anything that you're already doing. What you want to do is watch what you're doing and see how the things that you're doing change over time. And this is not something, if you really got a problem in your marriage, you know it. You don't need me to tell you. But if you think you might have a problem in your marriage, look at the things that you used to do and see if you're still doing them. Look at the things you're doing now and see if you're still doing them later. But Marriage is about doing. Everything that humans do is about doing. To be alive is to do. To be is to do. And what you do is what you want to do. What you did is want you, what you wanted to have done. And what you did matters in terms of understanding yourself, in, in terms of understanding what it is you're trying to do now, and in terms of understanding what's going on in your marriage and what you might need to, might need to do to fix it. But the absolutely simple, easy binary state ontological clue are you and your best beloved happily spending time together every morning before your day gets started. If you start your day married, you have an excellent chance, an exemplary chance, an almost unbeatable chance of finishing today married. And if you can get that, that much right every day, then the long run will take care of itself. And if you can't, then you are screwed, and so are your children. And my loyalty, frankly, is with your children, not with you, not with your spouse. My loyalty is with your children. And if you want to make the world that you promised them, 
then you make your spouse whole in the promises that you made when you committed your life to that other person. And if you do that, everything, your whole life, everything will be easier. I make huge promises and I promise you I deliver and put me to the test. For God's sake, put me to the test. For your children's sake, start every day married. And you'll be married for the rest of your life. My name is Greg Swan. I have nothing, nothing but gratitude to Anthony Dream Johnson for making me available to talk to you, for permitting me to have this access to your minds. I'm so grateful to Marilee Johnson, Mrs. Marilee Johnson, for tolerating me as the officiant at her marriage. And I will say to her and to every, everyone who loves things perfectly, there is a crack in everything, and that's how the light gets in. Leonard Cohen. So we have Shakespeare and Leonard Cohen. How much more improvement can you stand in one day? Bless you. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for your attention. Go grab yourself the life you dream about. It's yours for the taking.